Bibles, go ahead and turn with me uh, to 1 Kings. 1 Kings, uh, if you're visiting with us tonight, we've just been doing a, a study on Sunday evenings, uh, looking at the big picture of the Bible, getting an overview of each book, uh, and then also looking at kind of the the flow, the narrative of, of the redemption story from beginning to end. And so it'll take us a while to work through this, uh, but tonight we come to the book of First Kings, First Kings. And so uh, let's do this. Let's have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll, get, we'll get into the Word of God together this evening. Heavenly Father, as, as we come again before you, Lord, we thank you for the privilege that it is to gather as brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for the, the Lord's day that we've been able to have, and for the word that you have given us. And Lord, we come again because we want to hear more. We want to hear more of who you are and what you have done. And Lord, may you lift our hearts and our minds, and uh, Lord, may you open them to what you have for us. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness tonight. Lord, we do not deserve it. We, we don't deserve your love or your grace, but you have given it to us. And we thank you that you're on the throne, that you rule and reign and in the hearts and lives of men. And Lord, perhaps the greatest need for some would be to turn uh, from their self and turn to you tonight. And we pray for our church family, for our brothers and sisters in Christ here. We ask that you would conform us more to the image of Christ. Speak to us, Lord, that you would be glorified, that Jesus would be exalted. You know the needs of this body. Lord, you know the those who are uh, sick and hurting and those who have experienced loss. And We pray that you would be around about them as only you can. And we think of this little one uh, this evening down in Charleston, and we ask, Lord, that you would be here. Uh, be with them, be with Josh and Amy, Lord, it's, it's such a, a difficult time when you have a little one in the hospital, and so we pray that you would just come alongside them and use even this, Lord, to draw them closer to you, uh, to accomplish your good purposes, and Lord, Father, we pray that you would work in spite of me tonight for your glory, in Jesus' name we ask it, and amen. Whenever we come to a book like this, we always ask those those main questions when we're doing an overview, just the the who, what, when, where, and why, and we try and answer those each time. And so we want to do that again tonight, understanding that we're flowing out of the narrative, right? We finished first and second Samuel. You know, we saw the institution of Israel's first king. We saw the rise of David. We saw the fall of David and then his repentance and his faith. And so we've seen all of that. And so we're going to continue, right? That's what this is. Kings, uh, Samuel, Chronicles, they're, they're historical narrative they're following the actual accounts and 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 I, I find great joy every time we we, we do this uh, you know the word of God is just incredible uh, and is I want to encourage you and, and hopefully with these overviews encourage you to dig into the word for yourself we certainly cannot go into great detail as we as we do an overview like this and so hopefully this will pique your interest to dig into the word of God um, <laughs> you know when we answer the question who tonight, uh, very similar to Samuel, first and second Kings was originally one volume, right? Originally just Kings, right? And we didn't have a first and a second. You know, when it was translated into the Greek Septuagint, it was, it was separated into two books, really for the sake of those translators, those copyists, uh, just for length. Uh, and so that's why. So I thought about trying to do it all together, and for your sake and for mine, we're not going to do that tonight. We're going to do first, and then we'll come back and do Second Kings again later. Uh, the author of the book is unknown. Uh, you know, their tradition s- says Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, Ezra, but the reality is we do not know. We do know uh, that the author had to have been uh, someone who lived during, during the, the captivity in Babylon. And so that would have ruled out some of those traditional men like Jeremiah who did not go through the captivity in Babylon. Um, but the internal evidence points to one author. And, and understanding, right, this is not someone, right, what we have is, is a collection uh, of records and accounts. You know, this is a historian who's put this all together with purpose, right? But he's taken together, and, and so this is probably one author who's pulled sources from 
first-hand account of what took place with the people of Israel. Um, you know, the work itself uh, from you know, the entire work of Kings covers a 400-year period. First Kings covers about 120 of those years. Uh, so that's what we'll be looking at tonight. If, you, if you're interested in dates and that helps you to kind of put things in a framework, you're kind of a historical timeline, then these books cover from 971 to 561 B.C. And for a lot of you, that means nothing, but some of you are going, I know exactly where that lines up on, on the timeline. And so that, if that helps you, then that's good, all right? So um, you know, where, where is this all taking place? Really, the entire land, the entire nation of Israel. You remember in Samuel, we were focused in on three tribes. Now we're going to spread out over the entire land. In fact, in, fact in, in 1 Kings chapter 4, in verse 25, it says, And Judah and Israel lived in safety from Dan to Beersheba. Basically, that's saying from all the way here, from all the way here, right? The whole land uh, was, uh, is kind of encompassed. And then you have these, these enemies that are going to come into play, uh, Egypt and Syria and Assyria and Babylon, uh, and they're going to play a significant role, these surrounding nations. And so you'll see them come into play, even tonight, as we start out in 1 Kings. Um, what, what? What is going on? And, and I think that's, uh, that's an important question to ask. You know, what's happening? And, and so the answer is, you know, David is, you know, we, we left off with David's getting ready to go the way of all men, right? David's going to die. Uh, Solomon is going to ascend to the throne. He will establish himself as a strong, wise leader. Uh, in fact, during the reign of Solomon, Israel's going to experience their glory days. They are going to be a light to the nations. You know, these foreign countries are going to marvel at the work that God has done in the land of Israel. Following, following the death of Solomon, we see the division of, of Israel, right, into two separate kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, Israel and Judah. Uh, and so we'll, we'll kind of see how that plays out tonight. Why was it written? And uh, it, the answer to the why, it, it, and I think it helps just to think about, you know, Again, we're talking about someone who is now sitting in captivity, right, in Babylon, a foreign nation. This is the people of God, and he's looking back over history, right? So he, he wants to record history, but he also wants to learn from history. Right? So he's thinking back, uh, and, and we'll, we'll see that kind of stand out as we walk through certain sections and portions. But he's remembering the promises that God made. You know, who they are as a nation, you know, these the special people that God has set apart. And then he's going to remember how, how Israel has turned away from the Lord time and time again. He's going to kind of follow that, you know, chronicle that, and, and show how they ended up where they're at. What's the point of that? Why is he doing that? So they'll turn back, right? <laughs> turn back to the Lord, walk in his ways. You know, we want to learn from this. And that's true for us as well as the church today. We want to learn from the past. And in fact, uh, I, I mentioned this last week, 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 6. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. I think that's what the author was really trying to convey as he, as he pens this book. Let's look back over the history of our people and let's learn from it. Let's move Let's, let's move closer to the Lord. Let's move away from our rebellion and our sin that we have seen. Uh, if you want to outline the book, uh, there's several ways you could do it. I, I, I would separate it into three, three sections or three segments. Uh, chapters 1 through 11 really chronicle the rise and fall of Solomon. All right? So that chapters 1 through 11, that's a large portion of the book, uh, the rise and fall of Solomon. In chapters 12 through 16, what we see is the divided kingdom and its kings, all right? The divided kingdom and its kings. And so we'll see the kings of the northern kingdom and the kings of the southern kingdom and how, how the kingdom was split, how it was divided. And then the last, uh, the last chapters, chapter 17 through 22, maybe the most familiar chapters of 1 Kings, uh, accounts, uh, you know, the, we see the rise of the prophet Elijah and his dealings with King Ahab, right? And so that... That really takes you to the end uh, of, of the book of 1 Kings. And so that's how we'll kind of walk through this, through those three, uh, through those three, just kind of break down there. We'll start with Solomon. I don't have, 
Uh, sometimes it's Friday. I don't have a lot of time to read significant portions. So we're going to jump around a good bit. We'll read some sections, but you know, get your fingers ready, all right? Because right, we're going to move. All right, so first, first Kings, in, 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 in chapters 1 and 2, what we see is the death of David and the ascension of Solomon to the throne. And there's going to be some, you know, there's going to be some um, controversy there. Uh, one of David's sons, Adonijah, tries to set himself up on the throne. And uh, Bathsheba, Sol- you know, Solomon's mom, says, hey, David, we got a problem. Solomon's supposed to be on the throne. And so they, you know, David takes care of that. David makes sure that Solomon ascends to the throne. Adonijah takes his rightful place. In fact, he's going to end up dead here in a couple chapters uh, because he's going to try and usurp the authority of the king, of Solomon, and Solomon will have him put to death. Uh, But what we see here, especially in chapter 2, is that beautiful picture. David's getting ready to die, and he he gives instructions to his son. Uh, And and this is exactly what you want from a leader, from a king, but it's what you want from a father. Uh, Let's look at it just, just quickly, all right? First... 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart, with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. That really sets the stage for what's about to take place. David is about to die. He says, Solomon, follow the Lord. Walk in his ways. And Solomon's going to do that. He's going to start wonderfully. Right? He's going to follow you know, in the footsteps of his father, David, but we see that begin to spiral out of control as we walk through the book. And, uh, so we see that picture, right? Dad just, you know, son, here's, here's what I want for you. Here's what I want for your life. And this is good for any father, right? And, and, you know, it, it, to, to look at your children and say, I want you to walk with the Lord. I want you to follow them. And so we see that example. When you come to chapter 3, uh, this is really one of those familiar accounts, right? The Lord visits, the Lord visits Solomon, uh, and, and, and he says, Solomon, you know, how, you know, what can I give you, right? Solomon's getting ready to, to take the throne. Uh, look at verse 4, <laughs> chapter 3, verse 4, in the, or, I'm sorry, verse 5. It says, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this, this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen a great people too many to be numbered or counted for multitude give your servant therefore an understanding mind to govern your people that i may discern between good and evil for who is able to govern this your great people it pleased the lord that solomon had asked this and god said to him because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall rise after you. All right, so there's that, that beautiful picture here. The Lord grants Solomon his desire for wisdom. And, and we have a you know, record of that. In fact, we have many of the Proverbs that we have in Scripture are from Solomon. This is a man who is granted divine wisdom from the Lord. And, and we see an example of that right, right off the bat in chapter 3, that, that familiar story. Uh, the two ladies come with a baby. This is my baby. No, this is my baby. And Solomon says, well, here, you can each have one half, right? And the real mom says, no, give it to her, right? And so we see that wisdom play out there in chapter 3 in that familiar account. What I would say is this, you know, I, th- I think of James chapter 1 and verse, if any man lacks wisdom, right? any, of you, any of you fall in that category, right? 
we struggle, right? We, we need the wisdom of the Lord. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask, and the Lord will give generously. And so we have an example here. of This pleases the Lord. It pleases the Lord when we depend on him for wisdom, for direction, for guidance. And so, I, yeah, I don't know where you're at or what's going on, but I, I'm guessing there's probably certain situations you're dealing with and where, you know what, you need wisdom. Well, don't rely on your wisdom. This pleased the Lord when Solomon said, I need your guidance. I need your wisdom. And so, you know, the Lord is pleased when we come to him with these things. In chapter 4, there's just kind of a recounting of the, the wealth and the wisdom of this man. We see his, we see his kingdom really <laughs> growing bountifully. I'm not going to take time to look at all of that, but it's, it's a beautiful picture. As his, his, you know, again, God is blessing the nation of Israel. As, notice this. As the king goes, so goes the nation, right? And, and, and there's a good principle there for leadership, right? As the king goes, so goes the nation. And so we see in chapter 4 that blessing of the Lord. And then chapters 5 through 8, which we definitely don't have time to settle in on, but we're going to see the, the preparation and, and the building of the temple. Remember, David wanted to build a house for the Lord. And, and God told him no. He said no, but your son will, will do that. And so what you have in chapters 5 through 8 is, is exactly that. Solomon's going to oversee the building of the temple, a place where the Lord will reside. And, and, and this is an absolutely incredible incredible structure people came from all over the world to see the temple that solomon built the interior was glorious it was overlaid completely with gold and then there was that sanctuary right the holy of holies where the the shekinah glory of god dwelled (laughs) this is an incredible place and when you come to chapter eight we see the dedication of the temple you know, Solomon is going to uh, offer up this prayer of thanks uh, for the grace of God. And I, I want to point out part of you know, it. It's a lengthy prayer, but I want to point out portions of it just to give you a picture of, of what's happening here as they see this temple constructed in the heart of Jerusalem, the city of David. Look at verse 15. It says, and, and he said, this is Solomon in prayer, Bless be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David, my father. Right? So we, we see this, right? And, and I, I think, again, this is really significant to those who are now sitting in captivity in Babylon. What, what's the author wanting to say? Great is thy faithfulness, right? He wants to say, God is faithful to his promise. He was faithful to David. Solomon here says, Lord, you have been faithful to the promise that you have given. In chapter 8 and verse 23, Solomon says, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. What's he saying? Look to the Lord who has mercy, who has a steadfast love that does not fade. we're We're here in Babylon, we're here in captivity, but God's love has not ceased for his people. Right? He's, he's drawing them back to the Lord. And we have this beautiful picture. Verse 27. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea. O Lord my God listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you have said, my name shall be there, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place. And listen to the plea of your servant and of your people, Israel, when they pray toward this place. And listen in heaven, your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. We have this picture, right? Solomon understands this building cannot contain the God of the universe. And yet he says, when we, oh, Lord, hear us when we call upon you. Hear us when we pray. And and brothers and sisters in Christ, this is a beautiful reminder for us tonight. Where where is the temple of God today? Well, we see in 1 Corinthians 3, the temple is the, the church, right? The body of Christ. And then in 1 Corinthians 6, 
the Spirit of God indwells us, that we are the temple of God, and we have this beautiful promise here, right, that we can, hear, oh, Lord, hear us, right? And when you hear us, forgive. Oh, how we desperately need that, right? If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of our right. But knowing that when we call upon him, he hears our prayers. This is what Solomon, in fact, this is the way the Lord responds and says, I will, I'll hear your prayer. <laughs> Look down at verse 59, verse 59 of chapter 8. Let these words of mine, with which I have pleaded before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night. And may he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel as each day requires, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God. There is no other. <laughs> There's only one true, glorious God. And Solomon's desire is that all the earth will see him, will know him. Oh, that's the desire of, of our heart today, is it not? Behold our God. <laughs> right? That's what we want. That's what we desire. And, and then in chapter 9, we have a visit from the Lord. Again, Solomon gets a second visit from the Lord. That's nice, isn't it? <laughs> How we would desire that. But uh, look at verse 2. The Lord appeared to Solomon a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon, and the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your plea, which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. What's he saying? I've heard your prayer. I, I, I listen. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm listening. And, and then he continues in verse 4. And as for you, Solomon, if you will walk before me as David your father walked with the integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying, you shall not like a man on the throne of Israel. But if you turn aside from following me, you or your children, and do not keep my commands and my statutes that I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land that I have given them and the house that I have consecrated. For my name I will cast out of my sight, and Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all peoples. What was God's purpose for Israel, right? That the nations would see them and they would glorify God. He says, if you don't follow me, if you don't obey my commandments, if you don't keep this covenant, then I'm going to cut you off. And, and so we have this reminder, even as, as God is responding to Solomon's prayer, and he says, I, I hear your prayer, and I'm going to answer it. Be sure you follow me. Before you, be sure you follow after my word. Um, we see this, you know, this desire of Solomon that, you know, that, that the Lord will be glorified. We see it play out in chapter 10. You know, we, we have the visit of the, the queen of Sheba and the king of Tyre. They traveled great distances to come and talk to Solomon to see the Lord's house, to see how God has blessed the nation. And God is glorified in that. Uh, there's a recognition here from the nations around that Jehovah God is glorious, truly. And that's really the pinnacle, right? I mean, Solomon is the picture of, of a leader who begins well. <laughs> if we stopped here, this would be, it'd be wonderful, right? Solomon is also a reminder of those who begin well but do not finish well. Uh, I, I've told you that so many times. You know, Pastor Bill was, was one of those men who said, I want to finish well. And there's very few, there's very few who do that. They start strong and they finish strong. Solomon started strong, right? He's a, as a young man, he sought the Lord, he followed his commands, he walked in the ways of his father David. But in chapter 11, we see a swing. We see a shift. It happens quickly. You know, the seeds of that began early on, and, and I, I, I didn't have time to kind of point those out, but even at the beginning, at the outset, he, he, uh, he joined himself to the, uh, to the daughter of Pharaoh from, from Egypt, right? So he married a foreign wife. That was one of the things that the Lord had warned the people of Israel about. Solomon disregarded that, and that's going to come back, uh, in fact, 
Let's look at it together. Chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines. What an idiot. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> one is exactly right, right? And that's what God wants. God has designed one man, one woman for one life. That was true then, it's true now. But notice, exactly what God said would happen does happen. And his wives turn away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Right. This was the warning that God had given. He, he, he warned it's interesting to me, you, you, you go back to Deuteronomy, and God was giving direction, instruction to kings that did not even, they didn't have kings yet. Yet he gave kings instruction, Deuteronomy 17, and verse 17, and he, the king, shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Solomon blew it on both accounts, right? He acquired many wives, he acquired great wealth for himself. And his heart turned away from the Lord. Huh. You know, if we want to finish well, you know, we want to be like the Apostle Paul, right? I have, I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Right? If we want to do that, then what? We want to keep our eyes on the Lord. We want, to keep our, we want to walk in his ways. We want to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Right? He is our treasure. He is our reward. Not the things of this world. And Solomon lost sight of that. And when you come to, to verse 9 of, of chapter 11, it says the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I've commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. And so we're going to see that play out. In fact, in rapid succession here in chapter 11, <laughs> the Lord raises up three adversaries against Solomon. One from Egypt in verse 14, one out of Syria in verse 23, and then in verse 26, a man named Jeroboam, he's an Ephraimite, right out of the heart of Israel, a servant of Solomon. So the, the adversary is going to come from within, and this is going to, this is going to prove to be the true downfall to the house of Solomon, and to the unified nation of Israel. Right, so when we come to, you know, as we finish out chapter 11, we see the death of Solomon. He goes the way of all men. And then when we come to chapter 12, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, is to take the throne. I told you this is a section we would call the divided kingdom and its kings. Right, at this point, the kingdom is united. It has been united under Solomon's rule for 40 years. They've experienced great success. But when Rehoboam takes the throne, he's not like his father. He's not a wise man. He's a foolish man. Uh, in fact, his very first, his very first action is to <laughs> really upset all the people that serves him. <laughs> and they, they just turn away from him. In fact, they turn away from him and they follow who? Jeroboam. Jeroboam was the servant who God had raised up, uh, and, and we're going to see what happens. The people are going to follow Jeroboam, which is what the Lord predicted through a prophet. We don't have time to go back there. And Jeroboam is going to reign over the northern kingdom. We're going to see that kingdom divided. All right, so ten tribes to the north, that's what we know as Israel. Sometimes it gets confusing when you're reading that, right, and, and you see Israel. It's only referring to those northern kingdoms. And then Rehoboam is going to rule. He's going to reign over the southern kingdom kingdom, which is Judah, right? So hopefully that helps you make that. Israel is the north, Judah to the south, right? The tribe of Judah and Benjamin are in the south, and the rest of the tribes of Israel to the north, 
Right, so that kingdom has been divided. Jeroboam is reigning. And immediately in chapter 12, we see this man, Jeroboam, who is a, <laughs> out of concern for his kingdom, he reinstitutes idol worship. Where is the temple? It's in Judah. <laughs> right? Where are the people to go and worship? In Judah. Because right? that's where the temple's at. And Jeroboam's going, if they keep going down to Judah and they keep worshiping in, in Jerusalem in the temple, then they're going to start to follow Rehoboam again. I know what to do. So he sets up two idols on each side of his land, his territory. You know what they are? Golden calves. He didn't learn much, did he? Golden calf on each side. Jeroboam says, don't go to Judah. This is your God. This is the God who brought you out of Egypt. Literally, same words we saw back in Exodus. How foolish he is. He reinstitutes idolatry and the downfall of the kingdom of Israel begins. God had warned them, do not worship, do not set any other gods before me. Whew. And a downward spiral. And that's what we see. We see the, the fall of the northern kingdom. <laughs> what I'm going to do is just kind of recount for you a little bit. Uh, you know, we have um, in chapter 12 through 14, the rest of the reign of Jeroboam. Again, there's some entertaining stuff there. So if you want to take time to read, you'll see Jeroboam's hand is shriveled up and then unshriveled. And uh, you know, there's some interesting things that take place. We just, we're not going to take time, right? Following Jeroboam is a man named Dadab, Nadab, right? Jeroboam's son. Uh, and he's going to be overthrown by a king in 1 Corinthians, or 1 Kings. I got 1 Corinthians on my brain. All right, 1 Kings 15, all right? Basha, and he's going to wipe out Jeroboam's family completely. Right? So we've got a new family line ruling and reigning, and then his son Elah will reign, and then we have the same thing happening. All right? Zimri is going to wipe out the family of Basha. And then we're going to see this downward spiral. Timni in 1 Kings 16, Omri in 1 Kings 16, and then Ahab in 1 Kings 16 through the end of the book. Now, the thing that you see about all of the kings in the northern kingdom, every single one of them, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. One after another. They do not follow the commands. They, they continue in this idolatrous worship. And God is judging. He's judging the nation. Right? They're walking in sin and rebellion. And we come to Ahab in chapter 16. It says he did more evil than all of the others combined. Ahab's a wicked king. Remember, as, as goes the king, so goes the nation. Right? And we see the, 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 the nation, the, the northern kingdom of Israel, falling into deep idolatry and sin. Right? The southern kingdom, we see Rehoboam, right? Wicked king. He was not like his dad. He wasn't like Solomon. He led his people into sin, going through chapter 14. And then his son... Abijah, or Abijah, uh, takes over in chapter 15. And then his son, Asa, we see, a, we see a, a turn. Asa is a good king who follows after, it says, after his father, David. Not his actual father, right? But his, like, great, great, great grandfather, right? So we have, we have a king here who comes into power, and he's going to, he's going to set things straight in Israel. He's going to get rid of this idolatrous worship, apart from this worship in the high places. Right? This is a man who's identified as someone who walks after the Lord, whose heart was holy after the Lord. Oh, this is what we want. Right? This is what we desire. And so when we really, those middle chapters there set the stage for the end of the book. Uh, so we see Solomon's reign. We see the division of the kingdom. We see the downfall of the northern tribe. And then we see the rise of a prophet named Elijah. Elijah is going to... Elijah is going to take the word of the Lord to the northern tribe, to Israel. Why? Because God is going to judge them. When you come to chapter 17, Elijah goes to King Ahab. Right? This is the last man on earth that you want to stand before and say what Elijah is going to say. Because Elijah is going to say, Ahab, it's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. Yeah. And Ahab's like laughing him out of the court, but it doesn't rain. And, and Elijah goes and, and, and he, he lives by the brook Cherith. If, you, if you've grown up in Sunday school, you had a flannel board, then you've seen this, right? 
God feeds Elijah. Ravens bring him food to eat, and he drinks out of the brook until it dries up. And then the Lord says, Elijah, you need to get out of here and go to Zarephath. (laughs) And, And so Elijah goes to Zarephath. Where is Zarephath? It's right in the heart of Baal country. <laughs> right? if, if that, the Baal was the false god that was worshipped that had been brought into Israel. And God's going to do a work there in the house of a widow. You remember how it goes, right? She, she's, experiencing, she's experiencing the full weight of the drought. She's got no food. Her and her son are getting ready to eat their last meal and die. And Elijah says, oh, here, this, this is never going to run out. Right? And, and then her son gets sick. And is going to die. And Elijah resuscitates him from the dead. Right? So we see God at work in, in this wicked country of Baal, right? in spite of you know, this false god and this false worship. Now, meanwhile, back in Israel, things have gotten pretty bad. Right? There's no rain. It hasn't rained for three years. And God says, Elijah, it's time for you to go back. <laughs> right? Doesn't sound fun. But in chapter 18, we have that epic, that epic confrontation between the prophets of Baal and Elijah on Mount Carmel. Right? So you're familiar with that. Uh, man, we need more time. <laughs> All right. this, is, this is just a, 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 great, a great account of, you know, let me just read for you 1 Kings 18 and verse 39. Right? You know what's happening, right? The, the prophets of Baal are... They're going what? They're going crazy. They're cutting themselves. They're screaming. They're shouting. And nothing's happening. And Elijah just kneels down in front of the altar after wetting it down several times. And he just quietly prays. And the Lord sends fire and consumes the sacrifice. And everybody's going, I can't believe what I just saw. And in verse 39, it says, When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, Jehovah, he is God. The Lord, he is God. This Baal is nothing, right? Nothing. Jehovah is the one true God. And we have this, this incredible victory from the prophet Elijah. And then it's, it's so incredible because you see this man stand up to 400 prophets of Baal. And then the very next chapter, he's running from one woman. Hey, Jezebel, I mean, she's a wicked lady. <laughs> I, I probably would have ran too. Right? But he, I mean, he runs off into the wilderness. He throws himself a pity party. Yeah, he's going, oh, Lord, there's nobody but me. I'm all alone. And, and God says, no, I've got 7,000. I've got 7,000 prophets of Israel. And, and he encourages and he strengthens. Right? This is the account in, in, in chapter 19 where the Lord speaks to Elijah. Right? He's on the mountain, and, 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 and Elijah's looking for him in the fire and the strong wind, and it's a still, small voice that Elijah hears the Lord speak. In chapter 20, we see a, a victory. God's mercy for the people of Israel. Ahab experiences victory over Syria. And in chapter 21 uh, is that account of, of Naboth's vineyard, right? Ahab, I mean, <laughs> if you've read this story, you, you, if you haven't read it, you need to read it, all right? This is the king over all of Israel. He sees one man's vineyard. He says, I want that. I'll buy it from you. And Naboth says, no, this is my family's inheritance. You can't have it. And so Ahab babies around, and then Jezebel says, I know how to fix this. Basically, she puts a hit on Naboth, and when Naboth is dead, he says, go get your vineyard. And that's how that plays out. And, and that's exactly what Ahab does. And then <laughs> Elijah, the troubler of Israel, <laughs> Elijah, go, go see Ahab. Right? And he's going to pronounce judgment on the house of Ahab. He's going to cut off you and your family. And Ahab, this is one of those shocking moments. Ahab repents, <laughs> and God grants him mercy. Now, it's short-lived. Right? Not, not necessarily genuine repentance. And then in chapter 22, uh, it, it's kind of a fascinating account. Right? We see the king of the northern kingdom, Ahab, and the king of the southern kingdom, Jehoshaphat, another good king. Right? They're going to come together in this battle. And Ahab, yeah, the, brave, <laughs> the brave soldier that he is, says, Jehoshaphat, you wear, you wear the kingly garments, and I'll, I'll, I'll disguise myself. Right? And that way, when they come looking for the king, they'll come, to, they'll come at you, and I'll be okay. And I, the picture is so incredible because it, it just paints the picture of the sovereignty of God, right? Just by chance, you know, one soldier lets an arrow fly, and it, it hits Ahab, goes through his armor, hits him in the heart. Ahab dies in battle, right? He was just hiding out. 
but God, God sovereignly took care of Ahab, and, and, and we'll see that, that prophecy for Ahab and Jezebel, it plays out there. That takes you to the end of the, of the, of the book of 1 Kings, and it's kind of difficult because it's, like a, it's just like a stop. Right? It's like you're, you're following along this, this account, and it just stops in the middle uh, because it was meant to be a whole volume going into 2 Kings. But there's a lot that we can learn, a lot that we can take away from. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think one of the things that we see is, is the importance of leadership, the importance of godly leadership and the effect that it has. And this is true. And this is true for a nation, right? I mean, we, we should... Obviously, we pray. We pray earnestly for a godly leader, right, for our nation. But this is true for a church. This is why God has outlined those qualifications for elders, for deacons in the church, right? Godly leaders who will stand and follow the Lord are necessary if the church is going to grow and succeed. This is true for your home as well. I mean, we, we, have, we have grandfathers, we have fathers here who need to step up and be the leaders in their home that God has called them to be. Because as the leader goes, so goes. So goes the nation. So goes the church. So goes the home. Right? And so this is an important lesson to learn from kings. But we also are encouraged by a faithful God. A faithful God who keeps his promises. I mean, God made a promise to David. And in spite of the wickedness and the sin and the rebellion, he maintains that promise. And that should be encouraging to us tonight. Because let's be, let's be honest, we fall, right? We fail. And yet, we experience his mercy. He is long-suffering and patient with us. And he keeps his promise. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. I rest on that promise. Yeah. One day, we'll see him face to face. What a glorious promise that we have as his people. And then ultimately, we see the failure of earthly kings. And we talked about this last week, just pointing forward to the day when the king of kings will rule and reign. The one who will fulfill that Davidic promise, Jesus Christ, king of kings and lord of lords. And so we align ourselves, we submit ourselves to him, knowing that he is the one true king. There's so much that we can, we can say uh, let me encourage you. Go back and read some of these things for yourself. Um, but we're going to close in prayer tonight, just resting in the promises and the faithfulness of our God. Let's, let's close tonight. Father, we thank you for who you are. You are the one true God. There is none like you. Lord, our heart's desire is that your glory would go ab- over all the earth. Lord, but it must begin in us, in our hearts, in our minds. Forgive us for where we are distracted by lesser things. It's so easy for us to fall into the trap of, of chasing after the things of this world. We see a man like Solomon who began well and finished poorly. Lord, may that not be true of us. Oh, may we rest securely in your promises, in who you are and what you have done. We thank you that you raised up a king the Lord Jesus Christ, who rules and reigns today in our hearts and who will one day rule and reign from the throne of David for all eternity. Oh, may we, may we be obedient to you and to your word, that you may be glorified, that the nations would exalt the one true God. We ask this in Jesus' name, and amen.